so basically what we did last time was we went through the churches, okay? And we had gotten all the way to Laodicea. And I was, I was, I was going to show you the different overcoming phrases because I had them on a little PowerPoint. It was going to go relatively quickly, but we're just not going to do that. You can always go back and you can kind of read that for yourself. I just think it's, it's interesting and it's encouraging to go back and read the overcoming statements that was spoken to each one of the churches. Okay, you know, he that overcomes to Ephesus and, and, and the, if you're going to make him a pillar in, the, in my temple, the overcomer to other churches. I'm going to make them, you know, the, uh, let's see here, I got it right here. Ephesus, the, he that overcomes will be able to eat of the tree of life. Smyrna, he that overcomes will not be, will not be hurt at the second death. That's the great white throne judgment. Uh, he that overcomes will eat of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone. I will give him a new name. He that overcomes will have power over the nations. Uh, Sardis, he that overcomes will be clothed in white raiment. Uh, that's talking about the, the robes of righteousness. Philadelphia, he that overcomes will be a temple in the a pillar in the temple of my God. Like Laodicea, he that overcomes. Will, will sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So for me, the reason that it was, it, that's the first time I've ever seen it so clearly before, that these words that are given to the overcomers, to me, are very, very decisive about the end. Now listen, it's, it's also relevant for each Christian's life, no matter where they were in the time frame of the church. Does that make sense? Because you and I, we're either going to be here whenever the Lord comes to get his church or we're going to die in Christ. And, and the truth is, is that who is going to be an overcomer in their life and who's going to really be a servant of the Lord, you know? And, and, but I got to tell you that I believe that that message was specifically for in day saints. It was it, because it's all having to do with the next life. It's going into the millennial reign of Christ. Because whenever we're talking about the temple of God and being a pillar in the temple of God, he wasn't talking about the temple of Herod. He was talking about the new, the new temple that's going to come, the new heaven and the new earth. And so I just thought that that was interesting because that's the first time that I ever saw that, that clearly. But again, for Laodicea, the last thing he said was, for he that overcomes, he will be able to sit in my throne, just as I'm going to sit in my father's throne. And then as we transition in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, as he puts that up there, then, then it, it talks about, look, it says, after this, I looked and behold, are we having a hard time putting every, anything up there? Huh? Oh, okay, cool, cool. I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up here and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Now we're going to go backwards and we're going to go back and we're going to kind of break that down because that's important. This is a big transition, but I want you to just see a little bit of the overall picture of this chapter. Okay. It says immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So I just want you to see that as soon as we end Laodicea, the, the promise to the overcomer for Laodicea was he who overcomes will, will sit in my throne just as I have overcame and sit in my father's throne. And then now we're seeing a picture of the throne. And what I want you to see is, is that in this chapter more than anything, and we're going to try to read through the whole thing before it's over with, but I want to give you this, the, the, the main idea of this whole chapter. The main idea of this whole chapter is that there's 24 elders and there's four beasts is what it calls it. Beasts in other places of the Bible, they're called, uh, they're called uh, creatures and other places of the Bible, they're referred to as angels. But these four angels, beasts, whatever you want to call them, they cry, holy, holy, holy. And then these 24 elders, they take their crowns and they throw them at the feet of Jesus. And the way that it's worded, it almost sounds like this is a repetitious thing that's going on over and over and over again. The, the, because it says they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then again, the elders take their crowns off and they throw them at the feet of the Lord. And so I wanted you to see that this is the image that John sees after this is spoken of about the church. Then we move into this. Okay, now, now let's go backwards uh, to verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. I think that this is important for us to try to spend a little bit of time here. All right, so he says, after this. Now, 
just if anybody wants to, you know, to speak up and to give some ideas on what they think the after this is, then you're more than welcome to, to you know, to give, to say what you think it may be. I'm going to explain to you what I believe literally it is. But does anybody want to throw anything out there? Um, some people have. So when it comes to the pre-tribulation rapture position, all right? Many people believe that what this is saying is after the church age, okay? Because what they say is, is that the church is not real. The word church is not mentioned again after the first three chapters and that it's saying after this. And so they say after the church age, but what's really happening in the first three chapters, if, if, we, if we just got done studying it, is that Jesus gave John a specific message for the seven literal churches that were there during the first century AD. So after the message that's given to those seven churches was given, then this began to happen. If we went back to Revelation, I believe it's chapter 1 verse 19, Revelation 1 verse 19, we, will, we, we would be reminded that the Lord told John, write the things that you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now you can go back to Revelation 4.1. This is definitely beginning to be, we're moving into the area of things that are coming hereafter. But again, I want you to see this first scene, more than anything, is the throne of God and what's going on with these elders and with these four angels, okay? Because that's what the whole chapter is about. But we do need to spend a little bit of time on this. So... He says that after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Now, I'm not trying to get overly technical. I promise you that I'm not. But we do know that in, that in 1 Thessalonians 4, as a matter of fact, we can go there real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 16. It said, now this is talking about the rapture. This is one scripture that we have that we know. I mean, there's another one. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it too. But this scripture right here is undoubtedly letting us know that there will be a rapture in the church. I mean, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about a verse of scripture that literally specifically says that there's going to be a rapture of the church. There's no, you don't have to do no twisting and turning. You don't have to look up a Greek word. This scripture right here tells us that there's going to be a rapture of the church. And this is what Paul says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. So there's going to be a shout of the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. So there's going to be a shout of the voice of an archangel and a trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now, I wish that I could use my, my iPad. Because what I would do is I would press on the word up right there. That word up. And I would let you see in the Greek. I do have a chalkboard though. I would let you see in the Greek that the word up right there in the Greek. And up. Is this word right here, harpatso. And that's where we get the word, that, that's the Greek word for rapture. Now, let me just tell you this. How, how can you say that, preacher? Because the word rapture, I was told, wasn't even in the Bible. It's not in the, the Greek manuscript. It's not. But Jerome, who wrote the Latin version of the Bible, translated the word harpatso from the Greek into Latin, and the word he used was rapturo. That's where the word rapture comes from, and it comes from this verse right here, okay? So this is the one verse of scripture that we have, and the word up there describes is, is the word harpazo. All right, now again, I promise you, I'm not, it seems like I'm making a big deal, but this is what I always do, no, right? Ma, ma, here's that harpazo in Spanish. It means a tiger, thing like this. Take you, take, because because one of the words that mean that's what the, that word harpazo means that in Spanish, yeah. it means to, to for, yeah, and so the word in in the Greek literally means to be seized or to sometimes part of the word means to be taken away vital, 
okay? Like rapid, okay? And so, but let's go back and let's look at this. So one of the, one of the things that you noticed in 1 Thessalonians that we just read had to do with the fact that what, what they were taken up bodily, right? Isn't that what it said? In other words, that, and, and I want you to understand that too. Do you, and maybe you do know it, but maybe you don't. The word rapture is synonymous with the word resurrection. Did y'all know that already? Many of you probably already did. The word rapture is synonymous with the word resurrection, right? Because see, Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. And I'm talking about true resurrection. Look, Lazarus came back alive from the dead, but he died again. His bones are still in a tomb somewhere. But when the rapture takes place, when the voice of the archangel shouts and the trumpet of God blows, and on that day, Lazarus is going to come up out the grave. He's a man that's already died. He's already died twice. But the next time he comes up, he's coming up with a glorified body. I want you to understand that. The word rapture is synonymous with the word resurrection. So whenever we come, whenever the rapture takes place, this is a bodily resurrection. Amen? I want you to see that. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go there. But it talks about that which was sown in corruption will be raised in incorruption. At the trumpet of God, hallelujah, we will receive our glorified body. I'm making a point. It's a bodily resurrection. Look, and I, and I, want, and I want you to know this. I didn't know this for the longest time. I, listen, I've, I've been in church a long time. I've been in church not as long as some of you, but longer than some of you. And i got to be honest with you. Some of you have studied the Bible longer than I have. And some of you have studied the book of Revelation longer than I have. But i got to tell you that for a long time, I just took what people were telling me. And I didn't even know that a big part of the pre-tribulation rapture hinges on this verse right here. Where John says, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat upon the throne. Let's go back to verse one. See what it says right here. After this, I looked. So the pre-tribulation rapture position would be after the church age. I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. If, if I could click on my Greek and show you the word of there, it would mean even as like, like it's a simile. In other words, this is not a trumpet being blown. It's a voice that sounds like a trumpet. Again, I'm not trying to be overly technical. That, that alone doesn't make this not a pre-tribulation rapture, okay? But I'm just, I am making a point. Also, the word upright there is not harpazo. It's a completely different Greek word. That alone doesn't make this not a pre-tribulation rapture, but it is an interesting point. Because, because look, I will tell you another thing. Let me show you another spot real quick while I'm on that little concept there. 2 Corinthians 12, 1, 1 through 4. Did you know that Paul had a possible resurrection? I'm going to just tell you, or a possible rapture. I'm going to tell you that Paul had a possible rapture. Why are you saying impossible? Because Paul doesn't even know for sure whether or not he was raptured or not. And what, and what I mean, this is, and this is Paul speaking. It's King James. It's a little bit wordy right here. He said, it is not expedient, or in other words, a convenient or good thing for me doubtless to glory. In other words, it's not a good thing for me to give a bunch of glory about all this, about what happened to me. But I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. It's not a good thing for me to glory in front of you, but I'm about to tell you about something that happened to me. But he also, he starts to talk in the third person because he says, I knew a man in Christ. He's talking about himself right you can read any kind of, all scholars agree, Paul's talking about himself right here. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell. In other words, when this happened, whether I was in my body I cannot tell, or whether out of my body, meaning a spiritual bringing up to heaven, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one was caught up, harpazo. Such a one was raptured up, okay, and, and caught up into the third heaven. And he said, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words of which it is not lawful for a man to utter. I'm so glad that the Lord put, brought Paul up there, whether in the body or whether in the spirit. I don't know. <laughs> Paul does in the spirit. 
I don't know. <laughs> Paul doesn't know. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm so glad the Lord brought him up there and showed him things that he was able to see that he, he didn't even feel comfortable talking about. Because listen, Paul also spoke to us about the rapture. Paul spoke to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, and he said that in that day, with the shout of an archangel and the trumpet of God, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air, and there we shall be with the Lord forevermore. Amen. That's a good word. Praise God. Amen. You and I got that to hold on to. We might not, when this is done and it's going to be okay, we might not even all agree yet still when that's going to take place. But I'm here to tell you that we all need to agree that the Lord will come back for his church. The bridegroom is coming back for his bride. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Now let's go ahead and just spend a little bit more time here. So he says, look, uh, uh, but, but again, I want you to see he specifically, Paul talked about a bodily versus a spiritual bringing up to, to heaven. And here we have, as, as it were a trumpet talking with me, he says, come up hither and I will show you things to go. And look, immediately I was in the spirit. I think that's very important for us to understand. Immediately I was in the spirit. So, so look, look, and I'm going to tell you this right now. I asked Naya to send me brother Bob Cornell's notes from his revelation series and the way bob cornell worded this scripture right here and i'm perfect i love I, i'm great with the way he worded it. he worded this this is a type of the rapture exactly paul was a type of the rapture this is a type of the rapture but this is not the rapture right here it can't because what they what people have taught is is that now john is representative of the whole body of Christ. And so his being brought up is representative of the church. Now, I got to tell you that you got to, in my opinion, this is just my humble opinion, you got to do some twists and some turns to try to convince me that just because John went up in the spirit and saw a vision of the throne of God, that that is, is, is the actual rapture. A type of the rapture? Absolutely. I'm there with you, okay? And then, and then what he sees is he beholds a throne that was set in heaven, and he saw one that sat upon the throne. Amen? All right. Now, in verse 3, can you go to Revelation 4, verse 3? He says, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and like a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white rain. Alright, so let's just let's just slow down a little bit. So there's twenty-four seats, and there's twenty-four elders, and look. And the twenty-four elders are clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. So there's been a lot of speculation. I just want you to follow with me. I'm not trying to bore you with too much information. I hope I'm not boring you. I try to be as passionate and exciting as I can. Holy Spirit, help us to, to, to be able to receive. Amen. But, but what I want you to know is this, is that there's been a lot of speculation about who these 24 elders could be. Or who these 24 elders were. Right? Have you heard some different things? Has anybody want to throw anything out there? Huh? I'm saying the church. That's the church. That's that's the pre. That's a big part of the pre-tribulation yeah. rapture. Is that John is representative of the church, and then when he got up there, these other twenty-four people are representative of people throughout the church age. And so what? So what? Some people have said this is, and I've even taught this before. Okay, can I, I'm just going to be real with you. I've even taught this before. I'm not going to teach it again, but I've taught it before, and I did it out of honesty. Okay. So my idea was, well, hey, there was 12 tribes and there's 12 apostles. So it's representative of the Old Testament and the New Testament saints. I wasn't trying to do nothing wrong. And look, who knows? Maybe it is representative of 12 Old Testament brothers and 12 New Testament brothers. I can't tell you that it wasn't, but I can't tell you who it was. I heard one preacher say, oh, these are 12 pastors. I mean, 24 pastors, because the New Testament always calls elders are called pastors. Dude, that's, in my opinion, that's kind of taking a little bit of a stretch. But what I will tell you is this, that for me personally, and I don't, I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm trying to get everything out in front. I personally believe 
This is not when the rapture takes place anymore. I used to believe that way. And, okay, but the more I've studied, the more I've read, and this has been going on for quite a few years now, and I've explained that. And all I'm asking people to do, and I'm, I'm trying the best I can to give both sides, and all I'm asking people to do is to try to see something from a different angle. Okay, to, to try to look at something from it. I'm not asking you to believe the way I do, but I'm telling you, if you allow, if you only allow your brain to be locked into one way of seeing things, you will never be able to, to be, to be able to, to see it any differently, amen. you know, amen. And that's just the truth. And okay. So let's just take, a, let's just take, I'm going to tell you where I believe the rapture takes place. I believe the rapture takes place between seal number six and seal number seven. That's right. Seal number six and seal number seven. Now, when we get to the seals, I'm going to explain to you even in more detail why I believe that. The first piece of information that I've already given you out of the word of God comes out of Daniel. We've already talked about the fact that Daniel is the only book in chapter nine that speaks of a seven year period. And, and to when we get to it, because it says that there's a covenant and there's 77s determined upon your people. And in the middle of that covenant, it's broken by, and we, we would all agree on this. I know we would. Even if you don't know that you agree on this, I'm, I'm kind of telling you, you would agree with me. <laughs> How do you know that? Because I've, I've read commentaries about people from people that you believe, and that's what they believe. Seven-year period, 77s are determined upon your people, and in the middle, the Antichrist breaks that covenant. The last three and a half years are really begin to determine the wrath of God. Yes. I want to make a point right now, and, and I've been saying this for a long time. The tribulation of the seven years, if we're going to call it a seven-year tribulation is not the same thing as the wrath of God. That's right. We're going to get to that when we get to Revelation, when we start talking about the first seal being broken. Those seals being broken are not God's wrath. How, right. What are you talking about? First of all, seal number one is a counterfeit Christ. Because it's certainly not the one that's in Revelation 19. The counterfeit Christ comes also on a white stallion, just like it says in Revelation 19, Jesus will come. Seal number two, and I might be getting them mixed up, but just bear with me. Seal number two, if I'm not mistaken, is the black horse, or it might be the red horse, wars. War. Seal number three is the black horse, famine. Seal number four is the horse of death, chloros, green or the pale horse. Seal number five is the seal of the martyrs. Seal number six is whenever the, it's representative of the day of the Lord, when the sun will become dark and the moon will turn to blood and there's a great earthquake. Right. Seal number seven starts the trumpets. The first trumpet blown is the wrath of God. Listen, how are we going to say that seal number five is the wrath of God whenever it's the people of God dying for the word of God? That ain't the wrath of God. That's the wrath of the devil. The Revelation 12. He, he, he tries to usurp God's authority again. He has a war with Michael and his angels. He's thrown to the earth. And the word of God says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth where he comes down to you. Who? Satan. Having great wrath. Seal number five is not the wrath of God. <clears throat> That's right. Seal number five is God's people dying for the faith. Dying for the word of God. And becoming martyrs for the Lord. And I know I've said it many times, almost in every message that I preach here recently, that God's people have shed blood throughout the ages of the church age and even before that. All right? So I wanted you to see right there. And now, now I'm going to go ahead and go to Revelation 7 9. And I want you to see the difference if you can go to Revelation 7 9 for me. I want you to see that this is where I believe. And we're going to dig into this much deeper. I'm just trying to give you an example. So what did it say in Revelation 4.1? It said, And after this, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and I heard a voice as it were a trumpet. And it said, Come up here, hither. And whenever he got there, what did he see? I saw 24 seats, and I saw 24 elders. All right? Now what I want you to see is this. Is that it says, after this, this is Revelation 7. This is after the sixth seal. So this is a period of time between seal number 6 and seal number 7. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples 
and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And I'm going to keep reading because I'm not trying to make you just get a little piece of it. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says these people are. It says that these are people that have lost their life for the cause of God. And one of the elders answered and saying unto me, which are these which are arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said unto him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are they which come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. I want to make a point to you because I never knew this before. And you may not completely agree with it when I'm done. And that's going to be perfectly fine. But I want to make a point. When we, when we do teach the seals, Okay, we're going to compare them to Matthew 24. Y'all remember that I asked every one of y'all to do that already. Yeah. So you, by now, you sh I would, I'm not going to say you should have because I'm not trying to be a control freak. <laughs> but by now, you should have had ample opportunity to do that more than once because I told you how important I thought it was. All right. So whenever we do teach the seals, we're going to compare that to Matthew 24 in here. All right. And one of the things that I want you to understand is, is that if this is, if this is year zero, and this is year 3.5, and this is year seven, okay, that when we get to Matthew 24, Jesus specifically says this, after the tribulation of those days. One of the problems that I believe that we've had in the church is that we always called the whole seven year period the great tribulation. I'm not trying to get into wordplay here, but I'm trying to make a point. I've already said it, and I'm not backing up. The tribulation is not exactly the same as the wrath of God. So, with this in mind, what I'm trying to ask is, when, whenever and when we go back and we look at the seals, we're going to see it because it lines up exactly. Jesus in Matthew 24 starts talking about, about Antichrist. Seal number one is Antichrist. Then he talks about famines. Seal number two is famine. I'm sorry, wars. Then he talks about famines. Seal number three is famines. Then he talks about death and, he, and, and about death through pestilences and all these things. Seal number four is death. Then he talks about people dying for the faith. Seal number five is the mortars. And then he talks about a great earthquake. And if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to go back. And that the sun turns black and the moon turns blood. Seal number six is that. And then it says, and one will be in the field and another will be taken away. And two will be in a bed. And, and so that's the point that I'm trying to make. And he says, after the tribulation. So this is the thing to postulate right here. Is it possible that this is the tribulation? That's right. And that this begins the wrath of God. Okay. And listen, I want you to understand this too. In Daniel, we said this. And, we, and, we, and we, what we got to do is we've got to do something with this. In Daniel chapter 12, he said, Blessed is he that makes it to the 1,335 days. Blessed is he that makes it to the 1,335 days. And if I'm not mistaken, when I did my math, 1,260 days is this. 1260 days is 3.5 years and on a lunar calendar of a Jewish calendar 1335 days would be 75 days right here so again this is somewhat speculation because I can't absolutely prove it and so when I can't prove something I'm going to tell you I can't prove it but what I'm telling you is is that it seems like it lines up real good to me because the book of Daniel is the one that told us about this seven year period and now he's saying, blessed is he that makes it to the 1,335 days. What is he talking about? Could he be talking about the fact that after the tribulation of those days, when the wrath of God begins, there's another 75 days of what Jesus calls great tribulation. Great tribulation that if it weren't shortened, no flesh would make it. Even the elect, he said, would be deceived. 
Did he not say that? He said that. Amen. Even the elect would be deceived. And so what I want you to know is, the, this is the question. Could it be? Could it be that this is the tribulation and after the tribulation of those days, then this comes? Great tribulation and, and, and all of these things happening. So I, for right now, I really just wanted to make the point that for me, this is where I'm seeing the rapture. And the difference that we're seeing is when, J, when John, okay, again, pre-tribulation position, and this was a big thing because I've asked people before. I asked pastors before, and I didn't understand what they were saying, so I just, I just listened to what they were saying. John represents the church. The 24 elders represent the whole of the raptured body. So you got one man representative of the church, the 24 total representing all the people that were in heaven. Now we come to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, and we see a multitude. A multitude upon multitude of people that come from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That is what God's people are. They're people from all over the globe. All right. And so again, we're going to go through this in more detail as we move forward when we get to the seals. But I kind of just wanted to give you a little bit of a glimpse of why I'm trying to show you the difference between what I'm seeing, this is a, for John, this is a spiritual rapture or calling up, not a bodily. Okay? The rapture is synonymous with the resurrection and our bodies are going to go up and we're going to receive our glorified body. Again, if we're going to call this a type of the rapture, I'm with you. Thumbs up emoji. But to call this the rapture yeah. and, to, and to base our pre a, again, we're using this, this terminology, pre-tribulation rapture, to, to base our whole thought on a pre-seven-year rapture off of that by itself, I don't think we can do that. And that may not be what other people are doing. And again, I, we're, we're trying to find the scriptures to make, to make the, the position, all right? It, does that sound right, though? I'm just, and listen, you don't even have to shake your head. You can keep it as stiff as you want. But I got, and you don't have to say a word. But does that not sound right that we should be digging deep yep. and dissecting the scriptures to try to find out what they really say to see what we believe? Yep. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. That's right. Amen. Amen. Because what is the alternate? Have y'all thought this through yet? Because I've been up here like saying all this for quite a while, for about three years. Have y'all thought it through? If it's different than what we always believed, because you need to think it through, Christian. You might not even want to come back next week. And I hope that that's not true because I love you and I want you back over here. But have you really thought it through? If we all were going into this belief that we were going to be called out of here before the bad stuff really went down. And then it didn't happen that way. And we were completely clueless. And we're completely off guard. Do you, do you understand what, what could happen to people? People are going to fall away. People are going to apostatize from the faith if it was wrong. And nobody intended to deceive. Okay? But if it was wrong, people will be bitter with God, angry with God. <coughs> they want, listen, the more, I, I hate to say it, there's going to be so much deception already in the world that there's a possibility that people would be deceived into taking the mark of the beast because they would have believed that the mark of the beast would have never been here. That's right. Because they were already going to be gone. That's right. So he, he, he's brought up and he says that as, as there were a trumpet talking with him. He says, immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, one that sat upon the throne. <coughs> He says that there were 24 seats, 24 elders, and that there were in white raiment. Now, did, you did notice when we went to Revelation 7, all those people were in white raiment, right? There's a lot that we could say about that. Those that were under the altar, when we talked about seal number 5, they were all in white raiment, all right? Uh, and they had crowns of gold on their head. So I just wanted to make a point, and I, I don't really have time to go to all the scriptures because I'm we it's already been a long night, and I appreciate y'all's patience. But I personally don't know who the 24 elders are. I, there's a lot of possibilities, um, but I but I do believe maybe okay in First Chronicles 24, if you read verses one through seven, 
uh, that's during the time frame when David was king. There's a big connection between Jesus and David. Y'all know that, right? The Bible says Jesus is going to rule on the throne of David. Okay. David was a type of Jesus as king. Amen. And so there's a big connection between Jesus and David. During David's reign as king, the Levitical priests were broken up into 24 sections. I think that's kind of interesting. It doesn't mean that these guys are the, are the 24. But I think that it's a type of something because in Revelation 5 it says that he has made us kings and priests unto our God. And so what I do know about these elders is that there's 24 of them. And I do know that they have white raiment on. Okay, and I do know that they have crowns. And so it's kind of like king priests. You see what I'm saying? But again, that's speculation. I can't prove it. I can just give other scriptures to try to validate my thought behind it. All right? But again, it could be representing the 12 tribes. It could be representing the 12. But I have a hard time buying into that this is representing the whole body that's been raptured. That's just, I'm having a hard time with that now. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And we already talked about the seven spirits and described the seven attributes out of Isaiah 11. We did that recently. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now look, I got to tell you also, I'm not going to really go into this too deep, but Ezekiel talks about some creatures that look like this. Isaiah talks about some creatures that look like this. In some passages, they have six wings. In some passages, they have four wings. In some passages, they have these same faces. All right. But I do think it's interesting to look at what, because, I, you know, th to me, this is an interesting thing. Somebody uh, pointed this out before. If you look at the four Gospels, now this doesn't mean that that's what this is. Listen, the book of Revelation, there is some speculation in this because it, it's what you call cryptic. It's, mis it's mysterious. It's, it's apocalyptic literature. There's, it's, it's full of symbolism. Yes, we should believe things literally when we know that they're literal. Amen. And I believe that these creatures literally look like this. There's no reason for me not to believe that. Right? So it says right here, the first beast was like a lion. Well, you know, Matthew, when you read the book of Matthew, Jesus is described as the king because it, it breaks off of his lineage and it talks about Solomon and the connection to all of that. So, interestingly enough, it focuses on Jesus as king. The second one is a beast like a calf, which is like what an oxen is. Mark, Mark describes Jesus as a servant. A, a, an ox or a calf is born to be a beast of burden. They plow fields. They, they, they do heavy work. Okay. Uh, the third beast had a face like a man. Luke describes the man Jesus. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, which... Flying. Anyway, John describes him as deity. Again, can't prove it, but it's just an interesting side note. All right. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. And this is what these beasts do. I've already said it. We're just reading through. And they cried, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you have created all things and for your pleasure they are and were Created. Let's just go back real quick and let's take a look at that again and see how they did that. It says they're full of eyes and they rest not. I want you to see that. They rest not day and night. Saying, does it not sound like this is perpetual? Yeah. Sounds like it to me. They rest not day and night. 
There's a lot of different things that can be said about it. I'm just telling you, I did not get into it. Sometimes these angels or these creatures are called seraphim. Sometimes they're called cherubim. Lucifer, before his fall, was known as the cherub that covers. There's, there's a lot of interesting information in all of this. But again, just to, just to keep it relatively simple and not do information overload, I want you to see that these creatures, this is what they do. Perpetually crying, holy, holy, holy. And when they do, the elders fall down and they worship God and they throw their crowns, their victory crowns, at the feet of God. And they worship him that lives forever and ever and ever. Now listen, I don't know if you're like me or not, but when I first got saved, I was still so full of myself. And I probably still am. <laughs> Lord, please keep killing the old man. Amen? But I will say this. I can at least have a glimpse of how good God has been to me. Does that make sense? Have some of y'all have, I hope God's been good to you. I hope you can see in some areas of your life where he's been good to you. And God has been very good to me. And got me to a place where I'm grateful for what God's done. And in my life, I do believe that he is worthy. I don't always give him the worship that he deserves, but I'm telling you right now, in spite of myself, God has been good to me. Amen? And I want to worship him. That's why sometimes on Sundays or whatever or Wednesday nights, I encourage y'all, let's worship the Lord. You know what? I, I personally feel like the music sounds awesome. But you know what? Everybody has got a, can have opinions about different things. You know, even whenever I was playing music on my phone, I'd be like, man, let's worship the Lord. Amen. He's worthy. And Naya and Angie tell us stories about when they were at that women's camp and how they wouldn't even have music. And they would just start to clap and they would sing praise to God. I'm telling you, I need you to understand this. Worship towards God is not the same as entertaining music. It's not the same. And we have gotten confused in the church. I'm telling you right now, just, just whenever we, they were singing that song, Holy Night, the other night when we had the Christmas party. I don't know if y'all can feel that or not, but I'm telling you right now. That the word, listen, and you know what that is? That's an anointed song. Right. Sometimes people put the emphasis on the anointing of the person. Oh, well, if the, if the music ministry isn't prayed up the way, listen, music ministry, please pray. But I'm just saying, preacher, pr please pray. But, but can I tell you something? The word of God is anointed. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit wants to move and work through the word of God in the hearts of people. Listen, whenever a song is anointed, you know that song is anointed because it was telling the truth. And who knows? Who, oh, man, who knows where that man was, whoever that man was in 1847. I looked the date up. It was 1847 when he wrote that. Who knows what he had been through already in his life. But when he said those simple words, you know, the world in sin and error pining. And I looked that word pining up. They all knew what it meant whenever they were singing. And I didn't know what it meant. But when I looked it up, then they were longing for, the, for someone to show up. The world was in sin and error error and their hearts they whether they knew it or not they were longing for something the whole time that they lived on the inside they were longing and most of the time people out here they longing for something the people you work with the people that you that you talk to they're longing for something why do you think people keep trying to find something new to stick in that hole in their heart right. they longing and they don't even know what they long for and the whole holy night amen the night that God gave us, the night of our dear Savior's birth. Oh, thank you, Lord. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. What a beautiful, beautiful night that was. Born so that he could die for your sin, friend. Born so that he could die for my sin. Like Gaudi was saying, what a message, what a message. Hallelujah. God's had this plan. What he was trying to, I believe what he was trying to show us, and, and we tried to show it, is that... God's not going to change his plan. Amen. I, I wanted to even talk about Abihu and Nadab tonight. That's who he was talking about. Them two priests that died. That's who he was talking about. They were Aaron's sons. They did it wrong. They died. And because of that, there were other sons. And it was those sons that were broken up into the 24. Amen. Sections of David's priests. Anyway, here we go. We're going to close. Oh, Lord, you're worthy to receive glory and honor. Power, because look, you have created all things. One of the songs that they sang tonight talked about God the Creator. He's worthy because He created all things. Amen. 
and for your pleasure they are and were created. I don't know, you know, I would imagine that somebody that's like the atheist and hears that, I would imagine they poke their chest out and they get angry. I'm not gonna fall down and throw my crown down at anybody. I'm not gonna, uh, who does he think he is to create me for his pleasure? You know, uh, no. What, what is he? Is he some egomaniac? And he, yeah, listen, I don't, I'm telling you, the little bitty glimpse I have of God, I want to give him worship. Yeah. I'm so grateful for what he's done. And listen, church, when we get there, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be, I'm just trying to admit to you because if I thought it, you've probably thought it too. I'd be driving down the road and the preacher would say, when you get to heaven, all you're going to do is worship the Lord. You're just going to keep worshiping the Lord. And I don't know exactly how true that is, but I do know that whenever they would say that, it didn't really, can I just say it like this? It didn't really turn me on that. I'm like, man, that sounds boring, dude. Like, I want to just live life, man. Let's do this and hit the throttle with this guy. Because I still, my old man was still alive. My new man says, Lord, you created all of this for your pleasure. You create. Thank you for creating me, God. Thank you for letting me hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to, to send your son to die for me so that I can live in eternity with you. Why would you receive pleasure out of somebody like me? You know, David said that real quick and we're closing. I don't know if he did, but I feel like he probably was walking by. You know, they would have a reflection on the, they had reflective metal. They didn't really have a mirror. Sometimes the, the King James says mirror, but they didn't know how to describe it. But reflective mirror, uh, reflective metal. I believe that one day, I can't prove it because in one of the Psalms, and I can't remember where, I believe David was walking by and he looked at himself. And he just, he, David understood God at a level because he understood the forgiveness of God. And he had a heart after the Lord. And I just believe when he looked at himself, he said, what is man that you are mindful of him? Mm -hmm. yeah. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is it about us that even made you desire to create us? You know? And I don't understand. I don't understand why God would take pleasure in me. But, but the Bible says he does. And he created me for that purpose. He created you for that purpose. Right? He created you and he gave you a free will and then he gave you the gospel. And you know what he's asking? Give yourself back to me. I gave you that free will. Give yourself.